This is all part of the, sub, the immensely complicated South China Sea disputes. Okay? And this dispute is not between only the Philippines and China. It is between China and the rest of Southeast Asian nations bordering the South China Sea. How did this come about? We'll go through it in brief. We'll be into these uh, slides. Next, please. Now, first of all, uh, before we before we look at uh, what happened, let's take uh, well, let's take into account what is actually at stake. Why are these various countries claiming the South China Sea or parts thereof? Now, this map, another representation which I made, shows you both the nine dash line claim of China based on that 2009 map. You know, basically, just traced it. There's no coordinates. There's no claim of accuracy here, no, because it's just a trace uh, against the potential 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone of the Philippines under UNCLOS and the various islands, rocks and reefs that we currently occupy as well as Carbo Shoal. Most people when they talk about the South China Sea think of only those two, the Nine Dash Line versus the Philippine EZ and the islands. But when you look at it, that is not really what's valuable. Okay? What's valuable is what is encompassed within those lines. And that is the resources of the sea, the South China Sea. And next slide, please. If we talk about fisheries, you know, and this probably can bring things into perspective, this is based on two uh, data sets. One is the locations of po po possible coral reef areas, and this is the shallow reef, shallow reef area of 150 meters deep, outlined there in yellow. And so you see that there are, uh, along the coastline, uh, China, Vietnam has a huge area of shallow waters beyond their shores, while the Philippines practically has none, except for that portion of Palawan, no? west of Palawan. And then you have the shallower areas within the Spratly Island region, which is this entire region, by the way. No? We are not claiming that entire region. We're only claiming the part that we call the Palayan Island Group, which is up to around here. Okay. Spratly Island is not there. It's not within the area that we're claiming. It's outside. Okay. Um, this is Makeskilba, a shallow area. Uh, and then these are the Paracels, which are being claimed between, by uh, China and Vietnam. We are not claiming anything in the Paracels. This happens to also be the location of Woody Island, where just this week, uh, it was reported that China had installed uh, missile batteries. Okay? So this is a totally different area. We have nothing to do with this. Okay? This is our area of our concern as well as about the in law. Okay? Now, if you notice, when you talk about fisheries within the South China Sea which are being disputed, most of the fisheries, which are the, the most intensively used areas which are highlighted in orange, they're mostly close to the shores of the various countries with the exception of this area, which is more or less in the middle of the high seas and is in a relatively deeper area. Okay? Unlike this one where you have that shallow area, this one does not. Okay? Uh, so the fisheries are actually concentrated along the coastline of these various countries. Okay? And so in terms of fishing activity within the South China Sea, historically there's actually been relatively less, much less than along the coastline. It's only been in the past couple of years, uh, in fact, since 2011, that the intensity of fishing within this area has actually increased. And the, what accounts for it, actually, is the fact that China has actively uh, encouraged its fishing fleets based around the South Shore and Hainan to move out of their coastal area and into the Spratly Island group. Reason? The fishery resources on the southern coast have already been depleted. And there is no other fishing ground there uh, except for perhaps aquaculture. And if you want more, uh, if you want captured fisheries to continue, you have to move out. And since these, are, these coastal fisheries are basically fishing for uh, bottom dwelling fish, coral, based, uh, coral species, etc., food fish, the closest is basically here and here. And that's why they've been moving out to this area. 
Um, on the other hand, Philippine fisheries have still concentrated largely within archipelagic waters that you see there, as well as along the western, Palau uh, west of, uh, northern west of Palawan. This is still the richest fishing ground of the Philippines. 20% of our total fish catch is estimated to come from this area. And the fishers around this area are not fishers from Palawan. They're fishers from the Botas and the Visayas. This is uh, a representation of the so-called petroleum, or sorry, sedimentary basins where petroleum reserves can be found. The redder they are, the more petroleum reserves there are. Okay. And so you see that again, similar to fishing, when you talk about petroleum, actually most of the petroleum is near the coastline of the various countries. The petroleum content of the middle part of the South China Sea, particularly this light area here, is zero. While along these darker areas here, it's still unknown to maybe minimal. And, the, the, and that is based on American uh, uh, data no, from all, collated from all the various oil companies uh, operating in this region. Okay? So even when you talk about petroleum in South China Sea, you also have to be careful and discriminating. It's not the entire South China Sea which is rich in petroleum. In fact, when the U.S. government comes up with an estimate of petroleum potential to South China Sea, the petroleum potential includes all of these areas. So the South China Sea for the United States includes up to here and here, no? and here. And those are not really part of the disputed areas around the islands here and here. Okay. So you could say that there's a lot of um, um, exaggeration, a lot of misunderstanding as well, misappreciation of the nature really and the causes of these disputes. You know? And unfortunately, most people, including governments, are under that misperception um, or misunderstanding. Okay. Next slide, please. Take, for example, our own petroleum exploration activities. Most of our activities are focused around the shelf around Palawan, very close to our coastline. Okay. This is uh, um, Service Contract 72, which is over Reed Bank. This, is the one, this one is now controlled by the group of Mr. Mani Pamilina through Felix uh, Exploration, partnered with a Forum, Petrol, a Forum Energy of the UK. Okay. And this is the one that has been uh, subject to intense Chinese uh, um, attention. This is the one that they want to have joint development uh, with the Philippines. Okay. The thing is also, they have also been protesting Petroleum exploration in these areas here, no? ostensibly because, again, of the Nine Dash Line, because it's within the Nine Dash Line area. And that indicates uh, to you no? that is the, the clear manifestation of China's overreach in this area. Because unless China is claiming total sovereignty over the entire area of the Nine Dash Line, they cannot possibly protest. They cannot possibly protest a petroleum exploration being undertaken by the Philippines here. It's open water, kasi, open seas. And it's obviously within, what, 100 kilometers of the coastline of the Philippines. Okay. And that is now the problem. It's part of the problem. An over, even on China's part, an overreach with respect to the meaning of the Nine Dash Line. Okay. Whereas before, you remember, 1947, the title of the map is Map of the South Sea Islands, which indicates that it, it only refers to the islands. <coughs> this is already well beyond those islands. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, shipping. When you hear freedom of navigation, you know, the term freedom of navigation, or freedom of navigation and overflight, okay, these next two slides are what it's about. Freedom of navigation refers to the uh, freedom accorded to all states to traverse or to make use of the oceans for transportation beyond the territorial sea. Okay? And the territorial sea is only 12 nautical miles from the coastline or your baselines. Oh, by the way, it's indicated here as an orange line. So you can imagine also that they would be very close to the coastline here. Okay? All ships have the right to pass through um, the high sea, so-called, no? uh, including the EEZ. These blue lines represent shipping. Those are the uh, tracks, uh, actual tracks of vessels 
uh, in the year 2007. Okay, so one year's worth of data shows that these are the most intensively used routes through the South China Sea. Okay. Most of them passing through here in the middle and going to perhaps to Hong Kong, of course. No? But then portion also hugging the Philippine coastline here. And these ships are very varied. Okay? All sorts of ships, from tankers to bulk carriers to pleasure craft, use these uh, routes. When the United States talk, uh, talks about field navigation, it is principally concerned with the ability of its navy uh, to pass to make use of these routes as well. Okay. Problem is that China does not recognize that uh, right in favor of the United States or any military for that part, for that matter, and refuses. Uh, um, well, does not recognize, rather, uh, that the Americans can use these sea lanes, especially these areas close to the Chinese coastline, for military activities. It has extended that policy to include the entire South China Sea. So, China does not want any military operations, where even just passing through, you know, to take place within that large area. And that is the threat to America's interest in freedom navigation. Because if the, the U.S. Navy cannot pass through here, they would have to go around Indonesia, perhaps, or even Australia, in order to get to the Indian Ocean. And that is a serious impediment to military mobility. Okay. And so when the United States talks about uh, its interest in the South China Sea, it is principally concerned with that, the ability to pass through the South China Sea, both in ships and aircraft. Now, these are the common route of ships, the next uh, slide, please. This, on the other hand, is the common route of commercial aircraft. Okay, so you see again that the South China Sea is crisscrossed by these air routes, you know, as well as those shipping lanes. Okay, now, wait, could you go back to the previous one? One other thing you might notice is the location of these disputed islands. These are the ones that are of our concern, as well as cargo show. And the, its relationship to these lines, to the blue lines, the next slide, please. And here, particularly, the relationship Scarborough Shoal to the lines that go to Manila. And you see immediately the importance, the strategic importance of these islands. Okay. As far as the strategies in Scarborough go, from those vantage points, you can see everything that's happening in the South China Sea in terms of shipping. Okay. And from Scarborough Shoal, you can see everything that's happening in terms of shipping and air travel into and out of Manila. And that would include, of course, if there are any military uh, activities going on, whether it's Filipino or American, because this also happens to be the area where uh, most of the military will operate, so be part um, Manila. And that tells you why uh, these places are of immense strategic importance, even if from a research perspective, they may not be as valuable okay, at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Now, why is it important for China? Of course, we assume that it is because of the resources. Um, the South China Sea is uh, a huge area where historically all nations around it have been fishing. It is assumed to be also, a, as we mentioned earlier, uh, an area where petroleum reserves can be found. And we know that China, of course, will require enormous petroleum uh, reserves for its uh, energy consumption. Uh, but it's a lot more than that now. Because even if it were so, then you would expect some kind of rational thinking, really rational scientific, uh, scientific thinking to be going into their policies. But obviously it's a lot more than that now. It's actually a huge emotional and psychological issue for China. Particularly, this is a capture from one of their documentaries about the South China Sea, and you see here the propaganda value of the South China Sea being brought to bear. You see here, this was made by the uh, CCTV network, and you see again the, the propagandists making, you know, exploiting it uh, to the full by showing or representing the South China Sea as a kind of torch with China being the flame. Nothing more nationalistic than that, I guess. You can really there's a lot of imagination that's going into this. And so it's really now not just resources, not, there's also an element of national pride now in, that is invested 
in a very major way in the South China Sea. And that lets you understand as well, you know, probably gives you an idea, an inkling of the lengths that China will be willing to go to in order to protect its position on the South China Sea.